Okay, again, we're here with Dr. Rich Leday from Troy University, one of my colleagues who is our been there, done that guy when it comes to culture with his experience in Afghanistan. And uh, last time we talked about what culture was and had some examples. Now the question is, how do you develop cultural competency? What are the thoughts of what is cultural competency? Uh, how, what do we think the components are, or what is the Department of Defense think, if at least we can talk about that. And where, what's the difference between training and education in preparing this? So, you know, what is cultural competency and what are the skills that are associated with it? What do you, you know, give us your view on this. So I think cultural competency is the ability to learn. It's the ability to learn in another cultural environment and in, in a cultural environment that's different from from one's own so me it's the ability to not just use knowledge that's already created but also to create knowledge in the first place that's a core fundamental necessity of being culturally competent um, essentially you know the ability to um, you know learn on the fly if you will Right. But you have to have some basic level of cultural understanding of, of some knowledge of where you are, where, of, the, of the cultural environment that you're uh, that you're operating in. Sp sticking with the question of where do you go to learn this stuff? Um, I learned this stuff in grad school. Now, let me say let me say this, though. What I learned in grad school was how to do research. You know, I spent a lot of my time focused on a topic and building my knowledge base on that topic. Right. But I also learned how to learn. I learned how to do research. I learned how to go find sources, right? Not just in the library, not just in JSTOR. Sometimes those sources are on the ground, you know? So the work that I did in Afghanistan required me to go find sources if I didn't have knowledge. If I didn't understand the proper way to implement a development initiative in a given geographic area that I was working in, uh, I had to go find that knowledge, you know. So I did a lot of, you know, I did a lot of focus groups with political and religious leaders, but also tribal elders. And basically anyone who would talk to me, I did a lot of on the spot interviews, right? Very unstructured interviews, but I would still, I was still collecting data, you know. So as someone who was trained in political science, right? I understand that these are methodologies that are trained that that all social scientists are trained to use. I'm sorry, are educated to use. You know, all these methodologies are allow us also to kind of standardize, you know, not just the conversation when we get to the analysis part, but we're standardizing the way we're collecting data, you know. So as a, as a person who was educated in research methodology, like, you know, most political, in fact, the only political scientists who probably don't spend a lot of time in methodology are people who focus most of their attention on theory. But even a theorist is going to understand the basics of research methodology. You know, when I say survey interviews, the, you know, a political theorist still knows what I'm talking about, right? So the education, I argue, um, in the Applying Political Knowledge in Modern Combat article, I make the argument that that education is found in social science curriculum, right? And in this social science curriculum is also where we can find some of the knowledge of culture that's already out there, you know, pre-existing literature that helps us understand, you know, some things that may be people from the Western countries are operating under the NATO umbrella might want to know about before they go operate in a predominantly Islamic country, rural Afghanistan, rural Iraq, or even the cities, right? The, the more urbanized areas where Islam still matters, but there might be other aspects of either Afghan or, you know, Iraqi culture and, and, you know, society and economics and politics, these other things matter too, right? And that's all wrapped up in, you know, kind of what, we, what we've what we come to realize as the human terrain, you know? And that's what, you know, going back to 
trying to figure out a definition of culture, you know, it involves it's it's knowledge about the human terrain, right? What's going on in people's minds? It's the infrastructure of the mind, right? That ties people together. It allows individuals to be individuals, but also act within a within social, economic, political, religious settings, right? So there's something about the you know, the way people are connected that we need to understand that we can't just learn from a textbook alone. But if we have basic education in how knowledge is created to include research methodology, that is a way I think for us to help shape the way we train. Being educated in not just cultural knowledge, but being educated in how knowledge is created, right? That's where I think our education efforts need to focus, particularly you know, at the level of DOD, which spends a lot of time training and educating not just military officers, but also there's a lot of a lot of efforts been dumped into, and properly so, education for non-commissioned officers and other enlisted personnel as well, as they as the as the Department of Defense is trying to figure out how to keep pace with you know under try to keep pace with cultural knowledge on the ground, right? Making sure our people are prepared to operate in the places that they're sent to operate so that we can essentially do better at enacting U.S. foreign policy. So this has got me thinking, um, you've got some layers here, right? Mm -hmm. We can have, and, and I'm seeing it as, we can have general ideas about culture itself and say, look, and kind of the Gerd Hofstetter dimensions of culture and generalizations about, look, these are the ways people tend to differ in their thinking, right? And so we have a framework and uh, we get starting, we start to identify the known unknowns to use the Rumsfeld term of, hey, how, what are likely to be the sorts of things you need to check up on? Then you can learn about a culture. You can learn, and you've got a paper about Islam, right? And and how Islam generally affects things. But then you get into a situation, because you've said culture is everything that isn't DNA um, in our previous video. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that, you know, Gerd Hofstetter in, 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 in his book, he has this pyramid where he says, look, there's human nature on the bottom, there's culture in the middle, then there's individual personality on top of it. Yeah. And so you've got the culture, which is the shared, as he says, software of the mind. You have it as infrastructure of the mind. Thank you for giving me another word to use. I really appreciate <laughs> that. I'm going to use it. And then we have personality on top. And, and so what I'm taking a long time to get to is there's also that political science. Let's research. Let's check this. You know, let's go in and say, hey, I understand generally it. You know, Islam, you know, the, the mullahs may be worried about this sort of thing. You probably need to go in and check, hey, are they actually worried about that? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. because uh, I just remember people make such big mistakes of turning cultural knowledge into stereotypes. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and kind of learning. I just remember uh, back in the 80s when we were going to fight the godless communist horde. Um, and we kind of thought of it that way, mm -hmm. some of people. And they would say, but they would get into this whole thing. Well, if Marx says this, then these guys, <laughs> because they're Marxists, they should think that. And I used to go, that's not, Marx is dead. Marx's books are old. They might have read the book. They probably did, but they probably got interpretations of it. And then yeah. each individual, you know, some are going to be true believers. Others are going to, you know, have eschewed the Kool-Aid. And, um, and so I think those layers, because that comes to personality, right? That's why I think the yeah. pyramid's good because we've got personality on top of it. And the individual, because, you know, there's so many times that you have a cultural contradiction. In America, we're all very individualistic, but how do you sell us something? You sell us that we have time with the family, right? Because that yeah. we're, you know, even though we're individualistic, we still desire family time. Whereas maybe in Japan where everyone is not, maybe not so individualistic, They'll sell, hey, here's your headset because you can listen to your own music without disturbing your family. You be you without causing trouble. And those are, you know, those are the paradoxes that that play into, in that case, persuasive messaging. Um, yeah. And and so I think that's the important thing to get past it. But 
So we've got a lot of things going on. There are a lot of things we can study, I think, in that. Yeah. Well, and, you know, also, I think what you're saying is underscoring the need for having some sort of structured academic way to approach cultural situations and in, or, or cross-cultural uh, situations or interactions in part because it's, you know, for example, it's my political science education that helps me understand the layers, you know, that you're talking about, you know, like you're, and you're mentioning, you know, the big broad kind of individualistic versus collective, you know, what happens when you're dealing with gender relations under either one of those umbrellas? Ah, it's another know? dimension. Oh, exactly. Right. But it's, it's our ability to conceptualize and to some extent work in the abstract that, I, you know, that I argue at least implicitly in, in, in my own research is that's essentially what helps us operate in cross-cultural environments in the first place, right? It's that ability to kind of, you know, and not perfectly, right? But I do think that as, you know, scholars, we've achieved the ability to kind of wipe the slate clean, you know, and also maybe present our biases from the get-go so that those biases aren't necessarily clouding both our collection efforts and our analysis of the data that we've collected right so you know as you were as you were discussing and you know talking about the layers of you know the problems we might face or some of the solutions we might face when operating you know when, when engaged in military operations in different in different cultural environments you know, consider the, the wearing of the, the headscarf or the, the hijab, right? Um, some may think, particularly here in, you know, the developed Western world, that that's a symbol of oppression for Islamic women, right? So we need to free them of their head, of their headscarves when, you know, to even many educated Islamic women, um, that's a show of community. You know, that's, that's, that's something they need to be freed from. You know, that's a way that they signify that they're, you know, part of a community. So, you know, have an understanding that, you know, some of our, even some, some of our words may not necessarily translate neatly, you know, into another language. I, I, I tried to mention that earlier. I think I stumbled over my own tongue. But, you know, uh, in, in some of my earlier work, particularly looking at gender relations, as the military is trying to promote, you know, gender equality, in a conflict zone, uh, even the word empowerment, for example, right? Empowerment in, in to some people may not mean the same as it means, you know, to you and I. Empowered means like, you know, somebody's losing something. It's not that you're lifting another person up and giving another person more power. In some cultures, that may only happen at the expense of someone else. So if we're engaged in initiatives that are designed to promote female empowerment, and I start using the language of empowerment in a meeting with a bunch of Afghan male elders, they may not be as receptive to my reading initiative designed to promote literacy amongst females if I use the language of empowerment, right? So it's having a knowledge of, you know, things like language differences, you know, uh, religious differences, but it's also having the ability to learn that I think helps us kind of, you know, and we're, we'll never be perfect at removing our own biases. Uh, that's why, you know, co-authored work is best. But what we might be able to do is learn a little bit more about how our own bias and understanding kind of may be interfering with our planning processes. Yeah. And to circle back to your thing about research methods and our skills as social scientists, you would never do a survey without doing a sample, you know, without doing uh, either, uh, without doing it qualitatively, uh, you know, that's always part of developing a survey is you don't worry about a sample, you just give it to people who are in your population and you find out what words, and these are people in our own culture, right? Yeah. When we surveys yeah. for American policy, these are our own people. You just wanna say, hey, make sure the phrasing in here is not inadvertently, you know, because we know how easily people can be dis can be triggered or uh, you know results can be skewed uh, yeah. through that and so there's that and uh, but so those are some great points and uh, uh, I think uh, we're going to leave it there uh, with 
these are the things. There's no crystal clear answer. Culture is always a bit fuzzy, it seems like. Yeah. Um, and uh, I agree. but I think we've got some. Uh, it, it is certainly this has helped me as I'm as I'm teaching this course to kind of say, okay, these are things. And so, thank you, Rich, uh, uh, for two good videos. Hopefully, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully they're good. There are two videos. We're not the judges of whether they're good or not, right? I think that's yeah. anything. But no. uh, yeah, keep me keep me posted though, because um, you know, I'm I'm gonna end up I'm gonna end up teaching this in person. Um probably sooner than I teach it online. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, if this stuff can be used, let me know how receptive they are and let me know what that syllabus looks like. Yeah, well, yeah, still working on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> of refining, you know, I've got it well underway, but uh, um, uh, I am working on it. But, uh, and oh, one thing though, that, that hijab thing, the headscarf mm -hmm. example, have you seen Ms. Marvel? I saw some of it. There, I saw some of it. In, in Ms. Marvel, um, our, our girl, oh, I can't remember. Her, the main character has a yeah. friend who wears a headscarf. And a few episodes in, she talks about how she looks white. You know, that's her thing. She looks white. All of her friends look brown. And so if she doesn't have the headscarf on, they think she's posing. Yeah. And she says, when I put it on, I feel, like you said, part of the community. She actually said, I feel like me. Right? Yeah. But me being because she's part of their community. And so she, you know, no pun intended, religiously wears a headscarf. Whereas our main character and her family who are Pakistani, they go to they go to mosque, they cover up when they go to mosque. But the rest of the time and no one blinks an eye. You know, you yeah. know. Um, and in fact, they go to Pakistan, they go to Karachi and you know, very few people are. You know. um, and so but I just thought that that example uh, I also thought, by the way, Ms. Marvel was really kind of cool because we did see, we saw her going to church. We saw the mullah. The mullah's, a, a, you know, kind of stirred with her, but he's he's a go-to stand-up guy, you know? And, yeah. and yeah. you know, um, I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Yeah, All right, no. well, hey, thank you. Um, and I'll do something with it. Yeah, <laughs> no, back, let me know. I'll be, back to dip, I'll be back to dip the bucket in the well and talk about some of your other things like that Islam paper um at some point i'm sure yeah that's that the, the one that is in the nato volume i think yeah, that yeah, you gave me some, paper, several of them yeah that paper says a lot cool There's so lot we'll have we'll, we'll definitely get into that we can, redo, we can redo some of this too if it if it helps if what we just did today isn't clean enough we can i'm gonna get something mm -hmm. out of it you know the, the ideal is to chop it down anyway so um, yeah. You just got to trust that I'm not, I never change the meaning, but I often, I will shorten things and uh, very often lists when people say something and then they go on and give like five examples. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's gone. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to try to get this down to four minutes, right? The other guys with the forums, I'm trying to get down to four minutes. This, uh, because it's going to be a class thing, I'm going to be willing to go up to 15. Um and so it's going to be a little bit longer It's because it's a different thing. Yeah. I got to start doing this for mine, too. So it gives me practice. And, well, I don't know if my stuff's going to be any good. But, you know, hey, if you want to put it in there, it'll be on. Uh, feel free. It's on, it's yeah. on YouTube. 